Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with Diaz Trade Law, who will be exploring the key developments and emerging trends that are shaping international trade in 2024. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Jennifer Diaz is the president and founder of Diaz Trade Law. Jennifer is a board certified international attorney specializing in customs and international trade. For more than 17 years, Jennifer has counseled businesses of all sizes on complex customs issues and has a strong record of success in mitigating federal administrative enforcement actions. David Craven has been an active practitioner in customs and international trade law since his admission to the bar in 1985. Mr Craven has represented clients in a broad range of trade and customs matters from companies on six different continents. His companies range from sole proprietorships to large multinational entities. Rick Quinn is an of counsel attorney with Diaz Trade Law and an active member of the California Bar. He is admitted to practice before the United States District Court, Central District of California. His practice focuses primarily on US food and drug administration matters, including all pre-market qualification requirements post-market compliance matters and import related enforcement actions for startups, small to medium sized privately held firms and public companies. And completing today's panel is Dana Watts. Dana practiced in law, in, practiced law in multiple prominent Washington DC firms for many years before coming to Diaz Trade Law. She focuses her practice on all aspects of customs law, including forced labor related detentions, customs valuation, tariff classifications, Section 301 and Section 232 tariffs, country of origin and marking determinations and free trade agreements. Before we begin today's webinar, a quick housekeeping item. You can submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page and the panel will endeavour to answer as many of those questions during our quick Q&A session at the end. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to our panel to begin today's session. Thank you. Hi there, thank you so much to the Mondac team. Really excited to be with you for an hour and thank all of you for spending an hour with us today to talk about the future of international trade. We have a dream team here at Diaz Trade Law with together over a hundred years of experience to talk about all the fun alphabet soup ABCs that we have to deal with at the border in order to make sure that imports and exports go smoothly. There are over 47 federal regulatory agencies and a whole lot of headaches that can occur in the United States if one does not prepare actively. And at Diaz Trade Law, we really try to do one of two things. Either we're holding our clients' hands to help ensure that your imports are as seamless as possible. So that we call the best case scenario. Otherwise, we are wearing our capes and playing superheroes to try to get the best possible outcome in a dangerous situation for our clients. So we're here today to give you a recap on what we're seeing on the ground in all elements of customs slash Department of Commerce slash FDA realms. We've got a whole lot to talk about today with you. As, as is every lawyer, we all come with disclaimers. So although we do have the dream team here to talk to you today, every situation is different and we beg of you for your particular circumstances to communicate with your counsel and hopefully you give us a call as well because we're happy to talk to you about any issues that arise or any questions that you have as of today. So today we're going to first turn to Rick and really talk about FDA and what's going on and new requirements in the FDA space. There is a lot to discuss here. We've got a lot going on with MOCRA and if you don't know what MOCRA stands for, stay tuned. You're going to and we'll talk about Rick's crystal ball because as far as I know, he can predict the future. Rick knows everything about FDA past future and present, so he'll be able to give you his best guesses for what's going on and what his eyes are on and what he's really counseling clients on. We'll then turn to David to talk about what's going on in the anti-dumping countervailing duty space because there are over 670 anti-dumping countervailing duty orders. That's insane. It's an insane amount of orders for customs brokers and for importers to memorize, and that's crazy enough, the expectation of customs. So, David will talk a little bit about what's going on in the custom space and the expectations of U.S. customs on importers in the United States and or foreign importers, if you are a foreign IOR, and when you're importing to understand the scope of these anti-dumping orders, what's current and what's potentially in the pipeline and how you stay ahead of that. So I saw some of your questions and registration about 
what am I supposed to do to stay ahead of all of this anti-dumping? And great questions. We will absolutely talk about that because there's there's a lot to discuss in that space and that, that does begin to be difficult. So David's a pro in that realm and we'll absolutely communicate about that as well. I'll talk about import export enforcement and what we're seeing on the ground from a customs standpoint give you some interesting stats of what's going on in the customs landscape so you can see some of you asked some really interesting questions on the impact of 232 and 301 duties and what's going on on the ground we'll share some of those stats with you and share new tools from customs because customs loves a good dashboard so they've got a couple new dashboards in place so we'll tease those to you and talk about those we also love cheat sheets and resources so if you like me can get overwhelmed by the plethora of agencies and websites and links we've got some really great resources and cheat sheets for you We'll talk about those and how to get them. And we have to talk about forced labor because forced labor is the hottest topic that's not yet a hot topic for customs, but it should be. We were teased about forced labor becoming a priority trade initiative for U.S. Customs last year at the summit slash, I call it, I still call it the symposium for us old schoolers. And it, I believe, truly do believe forced labor is going to be a priority trade initiative for U.S. Customs, fully listed as a priority, but now it's being treated as a priority. We'll talk about those and Dana will lead us through some forced labor stats and what's going on on the ground in the forced labor space. So we have a lot to cover in an hour, but I think we can do it and I think we'll kill it. So let's start with you, Rick. Let's mm. talk about what is MOCRA, Rick? Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Jen. Uh, MOCRA is the Modernization of Cosmetics Act, which was uh, enacted last year, and it imposes a lot of regulatory obligations on the cosmetics uh, industry that didn't exist before. Uh, principally, as we have here, uh, FDA registration is required now for cosmetics uh, facilities. Basically, what that will do is it imposes an administrative requirement for firms to uh, notify FDA that they're operating in the market. But the main uh, sort of business reality is that it will now make firms visible to FDA more so than they have been in the past for the purposes of compliance and enforcement. Additionally, uh, there's a product listing requirement, and that basically means that anything you sell in the uh, U.S. market, you have to tell the government what the product is and what's in it. Um, and this is FDA's opportunity to have effectively perfect surveillance on ingredients and cosmetic safety. So that's going to, I think, represent um, a reasonably significant change for the industry to have to uh, make the government aware um, more so than just merely on their labeling, uh, but through uh, FDA's registration and product listing system. Um, and in keeping with that, uh, once once you have products listed, obviously now the government is aware of the specific product and the ingredients. Um, there's also an adverse events reporting obligation. Uh, this means that the responsible person, which is the party that's on the label, um, <clears throat> will have to notify FDA of adverse events. Most of what FDA is doing to manage MOCRA compliance is building out um, its systems on top of uh, its drug compliance system. So, for example, the FDA registration facility and the product listing facility, uh, which is called Cosmetics Direct, uh, looks a lot like um, the drug listing facility, although it has certain aspects which are less sophisticated. Um, and you see uh, that dependence or that interdependence between drugs and cosmetics. Uh, when you look at the adverse events reporting obligations, um, the forms are basically the same, um, although FDA has a guidance which basically tells you how compliance with that obligation is a little bit different. So now that the product is listed and there's an adverse events reporting obligation, uh, the sort of corollary with that is that there's a safety uh, substantiation. So now firms will be obligated to maintain evidence that their products are safe. And even though that's always been an implied obligation under the statute, now MOCRA makes it uh, much more significant in that there's statutory language. FDA has yet to tell the world what that actually means. Um, I speculate that FDA will utilize some definition that is uh, proffered through the Federal Trade Commission. Essentially, um, safety is established by competent and reliable scientific evidence. 
and then um, there's there'll be agency output and case law which defines what that means but from a records perspective it means that you know firms will need to maintain documentary evidence of safety uh, substantiation and probably um, from an operational perspective the biggest uh, challenge that MOCRA will provide to the industry is the requirement to comply with good manufacturing practices. At the moment, um, FDA doesn't have GMPs that they have proffered as a matter of regulation. Um, they do have guidance related to GMPs and they rely on a couple of industry standards. And uh, But the statute essentially says that FDA will be required to uh, promulgate regulations that are GMP based within the next three years. And so firms do well to begin to think about that. Um, essentially, and we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, the way that FDA is gonna reorganize, there'll be more resources devoted to uh, inspections, investigations, and import enforcement. And GMP compliance will form the basis for um, regulatory enforcement at the facility inspection level. So now that you have MOCRA requirements for FDA registration, which makes you visible to the agency, and you have product listing, which makes the products and their ingredients visible to the agency, soon you'll have the GMP requirement. So when FDA shows up, there's a regulatory rule set for how you're supposed to manufacture the product. And that'll be uh, pretty significant. I think the way that um, FDA will enforce it will be through the standard mechanisms, namely um, establishment inspection reports that become uh, observations uh, that require regulatory action. And so they become so-called Form 483s. And then if there's non-compliance, then potentially warning letters, which are uh, public announcements of the agency indicating that certain firms have not complied. And then um, you can expect, imp for, for foreign firms, you can expect FDA to promulgate uh, various detentions without physical examination or the so-called import alerts, um, not just related to cosmetic labeling, um, not just related to uh, the failure of a firm to maintain evidence indicating that their product is safe, but also um, for GMP compliance. So for example, there's there's already a drug GMP import alert, which is 6640, and that functions as an effective ban on um, foreign drug firms that don't meet GMP standards. Um, you can expect to see that for non-US firms uh, that don't meet uh, cosmetics GMP standards, because it's an easy way for FDA to protect public health to remove firms from the market uh, for failure to meet GMPs. So I think among all the requirements, um, registration is important, obviously. It's gonna have, it'll be an import hurdle if you don't register the firm. Uh, product listing will have the same function in terms of the import entry process. Um, adverse events reporting and the record keeping associated with that will be um, tested in the context of facility inspections and safety substantiation as well. But GMPs represent the biggest um, compliance opportunity and the biggest compliance risk. Um, certainly, uh, there's there are a couple things, fragrance allergen labeling, FDA is gonna proffer rules on that, uh, which, which will be somewhat complex in the sense that you'll have to identify um, fragrances and, and allergens related to those. Um, and then a couple things that aren't on the slide, but I think are worth mentioning. Um, FDA has an obligation to provide a point of view um, with respect to so-called PFAS or forever chemicals. Um, that's significant because many states are beginning to uh, regulate those in, in ways that are useful. Uh, and that is to say they're, they're articulating a point of view on those particular um, chemicals. Uh, as far as enforcement dates, the most important one um, to understand is FDA's registration. The obligation remains uh, today, but it's, it's FDA is exercising enforcement discretion um, so that they're not enforcing against firms for failure to register until uh, July of this year. You can see on the slide, um, there's some labeling obligations. Uh, I didn't 
mentioned on the previous slide, mandatory recall authority. Look, FDA already has that now. Um, there, it'll be probably just like what they have in foods, where they don't really use it. Uh, they they carry a relatively big enforcement stick, and there will be reasons for you to comply with the enforcement uh, procedures that they promulgate without having to bring out a mandatory recall. Um, in terms of the timeline here, I would think primarily in terms of registration and listing as the main ones, uh, you want to figure out how to comply with that. And of course, Diaz Trade Consulting has a portal that can assist with that to make it easy. Um, there's some technical complexity associated with it, but um, you can register and list uh, your products and your facility on Diaz Trade Consulting. Um, so we, we make it pretty easy for you to do that. Okay, and we also the offer slide. the U.S. agent services as well. So I want to make that clear as any foreign facility, one of the requirements similar to food mm -hmm. is that you have to appoint a U.S. agent. That's another service itself that DS Cage Consulting provides. Without that, you have no ability to register your facility if you're outside of the U.S. without somebody in the U.S. having the ability to communicate with FDA. When FDA wants to schedule those inspections that Rick talked about, they want to make sure that there's a U.S. party that they can communicate with. Yeah, and that's that's an important point um, because with the new uh, labeling rules where you have to have the responsible person um, contact information on the label, there's been some confusion about whether a domestic address is required. And the statute essentially allows you to put a website contact for serious adverse events reporting obligations. But if you're a non-US firm, you still do need a US agent. Um, <clears throat> so there's essentially now two requirements there. Um, with respect to uh, this next piece, which is FDA's announcement of uh, transformation of its human foods program or the so-called unified human foods program, there's a lot of regulatory complexity here that um, old hands would be better at articulating than me. What I'd like to focus on is what I think it means very practically. Um, basically what's happening is um, foods is gonna get a food compliance and enforcement is going to get a lot more money. And that when they get a lot more money, it means they're going to do a lot more things related to compliance and enforcement. Um, the most important thing uh, from a procedural perspective is that the Office of Regulatory Affairs is going to be subject matter delineated. Now, instead of ORA or the Office of Regulatory Affairs having this broad responsibility over all FDA regulated products, they still will, but they'll be subject matter divided by commodity. So the so the Office of Human Foods will have its own section of ORA that reports to it. And that's going to basically mean, I mean, at the moment, FDA's perspective, so far as I understand it, is that that's going to mean that um, compliance and enforcement happens with greater efficiency. Um, my perspective is that that means it's going to be more onerous, uh, especially with respect to the technical requirements of compliance and the way that will show up is in um, GMP compliance in, in my perspective. And, and that's also going to be true even though um, we're talking about human foods at the moment. Um, that reorganization of the Center for Food Science and Applied Nutrition um, is going to segregate out um, the Office of Cosmetics and Colors into the so-called Office of the Chief Scientist. And so the fact that cosmetics compliance is part of it is being outsourced to this new um, Office of Chief Scientist at headquarters, to my thinking, implies that there will be a significant focus for cosmetics on safety. Um, and on ingredient safety. So for cosmetics firms, when they're putting out new in, new products and new ingredients because of innovative functionality, they wanna make sure that they have safety squared away um, in, in all the right ways that, that you would if, and the way I would think about it is imagine if you were getting sued, um, how would you defend your claims before you can do that uh, be, before you, before any of that happens, before you decide to bring a product to market, make sure that you have the level of substantiation that you would want to have if you were in court. Okay, so returning to the Office of Human Foods, the basic idea is human foods are getting um, an overhaul. Uh, they're going to have a lot more resources, 
and ORA is being segmented across FDA commodities, um, including human foods. And what that's going to do is that's going to cause in investigations, inspections, and import enforcement to go up. <clears throat> yeah, look, and, and this is just a little bit more detail. They say focus on risk-based inspections. I my feeling is from my read of the evidence that this reorganization was catalyzed by um, the infant formula problem. So if um, a couple of years ago, so if you have foods that um, create unique risks, um, you should be concerned to make sure that those unique risks are managed both from a scientific and regulatory perspective. Um, the collaboration with state and local partners, I think that remains to be seen what that actually entails. Um, uh, but I expect that, you know, it would be reasonable to, to think that you're going to have potentially uh, state level enforcement following uh, federal enforcement, especially with respect to either inspections or with respect to uh, claims about products in the market being subject to recall for misbranding or adulteration. And the way, and so from a forward-thinking perspective, how do you how do you manage this uh, looming set of uh, new obligations, or or at least new emphasis on on existing obligations? Uh, you want to make sure that you invest in compliance. Um, you want to make sure that your people understand what the rules are. And and if I if I had to do um, a kind of risk assessment and say, what's the most important thing? Most important thing is going to be GMP compliance. And for food and for food suppliers, I find that um, one of the biggest risks is um, component ingredients, incoming product, not subject to the kind of testing and the kind of analysis that um, the product that comes out of the facility is. And so if you treat the supplier like you treat yourself, you'll stay out of trouble a lot of the time. Love it, Rick. I know when it comes to GMP import alerts, it's not exactly easy to get off. Quite often, FDA requires them and themselves to go to your facility to get off that GMP import alert. So that's it's definitely some great advice, Rick. Appreciate it. Sure. We are going to turn to ADCVD and talk about challenges in the ADCVD world, and then I will share with everybody our top 10 tips as well. You can get your own copy as well, because keeping up with ADCVD, David, it's a pleasure, right? Easy peasy. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Um, there's so much we could talk about today about ADCVD, um, but instead I've decided to talk about some more unusual challenges that have recently arisen in ADCVD. Um, the first of these is circumvention. Now imagine, if you will, if you are a producer of widgets in India, and there is an anti-dumping duty order on widgets from China. So you kick your heels back and you relax and say, I'm not worried about it. I produce my product in India. And historically, you would have been fine. However, when you make your widget in India, you use a lot of parts that you've obtained from China. So the Commerce Department has started these scope slash circumvention investigations, where they would then suddenly announce one day, we're looking at widgets coming in from India and whether or not they're subject to the China dumping and countervailing duty order. And we're going to make this retroactive and we're conducting an investigation. And you say to yourself, well, I'm not worried. My widgets are in fact made entirely of Indian material. So you decide to ignore the Commerce Department. And the Commerce Department says, well, we conducted an investigation and we found that we investigated three Indian widget producers, and we found that every single one of them was legitimately making their widgets in India. And we had four companies that did not cooperate. And because those four companies did not cooperate, including your client, the Commerce Department says, we've decided that those four companies must be cheating. And those widgets must really not be a product of India. 
So we're going to make everybody who brings widgets in from India certify prior to entry with a certification from both the producer and the importer that the widgets are in fact a product of India, not a product of China. And we're also going to say that those four producers that were uncooperative and did not respond when we asked them to are ineligible to make the certification. And you're saying, but wait a minute, my product is 100% Indian and it reaches back and it's retroactive to the date that the investigation goes on. And they said, well, you could always ask for an administrative review. The problem is these investigations take such a long period of time <clears throat> that the time for asking an administrative review will have passed. So what this now means, and by the way, the importers are the ones who take this in the neck because they're hit with these massive duties and potentially have no good way of responding. So what this has now created is a new situation where you no longer have to monitor simply cases filed against the countries where you bring product in. You now must look at products that are your product from other countries that are not subject to dumping to see if they could be dragged into one of these circumvention cases. So this is a new development. It's a very annoying development. Um, commerce was also very unclear as to how you would seek a review of your company to try to get off the bad list. And commerce has never promulgated regulations on this, but they're now starting to say, well, the only way to get off the bad list is to request an administrative review. So now as an importer, you need to have full cooperation from your foreign producer who's gotten on the bad list because they failed to cooperate. Now, ironically, if your producer in India was using Chinese material and their widgets would have been found to have been subject to the China order, if they cooperated with the Commerce Department and said this, they would have had a right going forward to certify that the product they're now shipping is not subject to the Indian order. So if you're a bad guy in the view of the Commerce Department, but you cooperate, you can still certify going forward. But if you're an innocent lamb in the woods and you've failed to fully cooperate or you've missed the filing deadline because um, you got the time wrong. You didn't know there was daylight savings time and you, you missed the deadline. You're out of luck. So that's the biggest new development is these enhanced circumvention cases. And there are quite a few of them at this point. And the problem with these circumvention cases is the next problem we have. There have been a lot of dumping cases filed recently and they fall into two categories. They fall into very narrow scopes such as the recently filed melamine case, which everyone agrees upon the definition of melamine, that it falls within a single HTS item. You know if you import melamine, it's a very clear and obvious order. On the other hand, there's this new aluminum extrusions case, which no one knows what's actually covered by it. And they've started filing these cases with these broad scopes and they said we would like to include within this case any aluminum extrusion that comes in the united states um even if it comes in with another product and if it comes in as part of another product then you pay duty on the portion of the aluminum extrusion that's in the product or if it's not a complete article of commerce even if it's an aluminum extrusion it's subject to duty as aluminum extrusions and so forth and we're in the middle of the scope process. And normally the Commerce Department would issue a ruling at the time of the preliminary of the countervail saying, well, we think this is the preliminary decision of scope. Well, they just issued that ruling last week and they said, it's too complicated. We don't know what's going on as the Commerce Department. 
So we're going to postpone issuing further guidance on scope until the anti-dumping preliminary. So now you have a lot of companies that are bringing product into the United States that may be subject to scope, may not be subject to scope, that are subject to the countervailing duty deposit requirement, which took effect uh, on Monday, yesterday. And how do they know? Is my product covered? Is my product not covered? Commerce doesn't know. How am I supposed to know? So these overly broad cases, and we've seen several of them now, <coughs> which cover more than just the product, are becoming a new trend in um, before the Commerce Department. And this case on aluminum extrusions is perhaps the most complicated and difficult case that's been out there. And it's uh, a big mess. It's also the next issue, large and complicated cases. The aluminum extrusions case covers many, many, many countries. The only country that was brought into the case that got out of it was the Dominican Republic because the domestic industry failed to note that if you are a member of the CBRA, the, the free trade agreement covering the Caribbean, you are entitled to be evaluated separately from all the other countries and your de minimis test, which doesn't apply to other countries, got out the only producer in the Dominican Republic from the dumping order notwithstanding the fact that they have been a multiple target of the domestic industry in EPA cases, which we're not gonna talk about today. But again, these large and complicated cases bring in so many countries and so many interrelationships that they're very hard to monitor. And we've had a number of these, and these cases have ranged from very simple products, such as paper bags. Paper bags, there are I want to say 12 cases involving paper bags from multiple countries to aluminum extrusions, which is a very complicated case. So these are some of the more interesting developments that are going on now in um, anti-dumping countervailing duty. And how do you keep up with them? I really don't know. I keep up with them because that's my job and I spend... 40 to 60 to 70 hours a week working on these matters. And so I know what's going on, um, but I know most companies can't have someone dedicated to spending 20 hours a week monitoring the Commerce Department and determining what they're doing, let alone monitoring the um, International Trade Commission, which is another interesting development um, because the International Trade Commission um, is another place where actions show up. And an example is a few weeks ago, there was a sunset review ongoing over a particular material. And the sunset review looks like it may sunset the countries out of the order that are, and that means the order would go away. And when the domestic industry realized this, the domestic industry filed a, a um, an escape clause case seeking to impose other duties on all of the imports of this product. And that's a case that doesn't show up at commerce. It's not technically anti-dumping countervailing duty, but it can affect your imports. And these are also other things that you have to monitor. Um, and I see that I'm running out of time here. Um, if any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If you have questions that are more or less too complicated, I'm happy to answer those offline as well. But um, I think that's where we're heading. These are the developments that are ongoing now. The one thing I did want to point out from anti-dumping is Customs has set out priority trade initiatives, which is what U.S. Customs cares about enforcing. The one thing David and I are seeing a lot of is U.S. Customs is getting heavily involved in anti-dumping enforcement. And technically, the fight we're having consistently is the Department of Commerce is supposed to be the arbiter, the decision maker when it comes to the scope of the order. And Customs is getting involved quite a bit saying these particular imports are covered by the scope. And we go to the Department of Commerce to say, Department of Commerce, are these covered by the scope or not? And Customs isn't necessarily honoring what the Department of Commerce is saying. And there's a lot of fighting back and forth over this. 
my bigger point to you is anti-dumping is incredibly complicated and it puts companies out of business every day. There are a lot of anti-dumping duties as high as 1,700 crazy percentage points. I mean, imagine adding a lot of people are very upset in regards to 301 duties and 25%. Now, anti-dumping, you're talking about hundreds of percentages that, that can get applied for anti-dumping and countervailing duties. If this is unanticipated by a company, it will absolutely put companies out of business. So in terms of preparation for it, if you don't have 70 hours a week to look into your particular case, everybody needs somebody like a David on their team to review their particular imports, to analyze the particular risk that you have. And we've given you a lot of resources on our cheat sheet. So if you email us, you'll get the PDF copy that, that gives you the actual links for that as well. There's, uh, so, there's, and may, yeah, go may, ahead. May I, may I add to that? That's actually one of the biggest issues in the enhanced circumvention cases. Because in one of the enhanced circumvention cases, which retroactively apply duty to a couple of companies that just didn't bother to respond, those importers were retroactively hit with 400% duties. And a 400% duty, no matter what your profit margin is, that's going to be, that's going to hurt. For sure. Not many companies can withstand that and stay in business, that is for sure. So I know you were talking about Costa Rica and CAFTA and the intersection with regards to anti-dumping. When it comes to free trade agreements and anti-dumping, I, I just want you to point out that Canada and Mexico aren't immune from dealing with anti-dumping. No. That's one of the questions we just got. So I just want you to say a few words on the fact that just because we have a free trade agreement in place, like we have CAFTA and we've got many free trade agreements in place like USMCA, just because we're a party to a free trade agreement doesn't mean that th those particular countries can never have a risk of anti-dumping. In fact, one of the longest disputes in the world is between the US and Canada on softwood lumber products. You will find quotes from President Benjamin Harrison talking about the low-cost, unfair sales of Canadian wood into softwood into the United States. Again, that's President Benjamin Harrison, who um, has been dead for well more than 100 years. And that dispute has continued to this day. It's one of the largest and most complicated anti-dumping duty cases, the softwood lumber from Canada case. Um, when it was filed, originally before the days of electronic filing, they actually backed up a semi-trailer to the Commerce Department and offloaded an entire semi-trailer full of paper. Um, needless to say, that created a bit of a crisis in the pulp industry. But the softwood lumber case is a perfect example of a major trade dispute with who is allegedly our closest trading partner. Love it. Customs publishes all sorts of dashboards and trade stats. I wanted you to see this. They right now are up to date with fiscal year 2022. And I, I, one of the questions we did receive was, what's the impact of 232, 301, 201 on trade? And I want you to see these numbers because these numbers are effective as of March 6, 2024, where you can see 210 billion, with a B, billion dollars have been collected in duties from the 301 duty assessment. So when we think of 301, we think of China and we think of our trade war with China and we think of our ongoing litigation. And I know our firm is a part of, and we've got hundreds of clients that are a part of this 301 active litigation that's ongoing with right now. I know we are in an appeals process. So David, can you give one minute worth of what's the latest and greatest with the 301 case? Sure, the 301 case was filed before the Court of International Trade and the Court of International Trade made a decision that we were not particularly happy with upholding the president's 301 proclamation. Um, it has gone to the Court of Appeals to the Federal Circuit. The case has been fully briefed and we're waiting for oral argument. And once oral argument is held and the way the CAFC does this, we won't know when the oral argument will be held um, until a month before it is held because the CAFC uh, gives you one month's notice of when you have argument. But after the argument is held, the court will then have to make a decision on our case. And we think it's a very strong case, but of course the dollar impact is something that 
we think just some judges may well take into account. And we also don't know which judges will judge the case. You don't know the judges until the day of oral argument when you walk into the courtroom and you see, oh, I don't like that judge. I don't like that judge. I'd better tell the client we're in trouble. Or I like that judge. I like that judge. The third judge is the judge who's been on the court for 50 years. She will be asleep through oral argument. We don't have to worry about her. Um, and by the way, that's really the case. Uh, she's been recently removed by the court from hearing cases. Um, but in any event, the decision will be made probably within days of the oral argument, but we won't know it because they will assign it to someone to write the decision and they'll argue over opinions just like the Supreme Court. So we will probably know the decision early to mid fall, I would guess. And that's not and the there's final. No state. way, I guarantee, in any way, shape, or form, that it is absolutely coming out at that time. It's an approximation. I just want to be clear, because what we are doing is every time there's an update with the court case, we send our clients an advisory notice, and we do want everyone to know. If you don't know what this case is about, the bottom line is if you and/or your clients are paying 301 Section 301 duties for List Three or List Four items items that are subject to list three or list four, you can be a part of this lawsuit. And crazy enough, you can still be a part of this lawsuit. So if you are paying and you're not part of the lawsuit, then let us know if you're interested in it. Because imagine if everybody else gets a recovery and you're not party to it, that would stink. If you're not if you're not a part of the case itself, you cannot be part of the recovery. If, and if by the, the way, wins. it's still building up. If you join the initial lawsuit, your amount was X, your amount is now X plus interest plus all of the 301 duties you've paid since we filed the lawsuit exactly. for for categories three and four. So it is, um, it is becoming a major financial issue for the United States. I wanted to share with you what's going on enforcement wise, because if you saw on the previous slide, just to go back for two seconds, look at the import value of goods, $3.3 trillion worth of goods came into the United States in 2022, the highest we've seen. And the total duties, taxes, fees collected 111 billion in just one year. So you know a lot of that's 301 as well. And now look at the enforcement on the flip side. What we are seeing in a party to are a lot of audits. There are RASAs that Dana and I get to be a part of, which are smaller audits and then bigger audits. And imagine customs camping out in your living room, the equivalent to your office for a week and or a month. Nobody wants this. It's not, it's not a painless exercise. And look at the penalties. Although they went down a little in 2022, the amounts are big and the money collected as a result of the audits in 2021, that was huge, 132 million. Now, whether or not the company Customs really got to collect this. That's another story. But allegedly, they've collected that much money, 77 million in 2022. So what we see quite a bit of are trade-related penalties. We call those 592s as well. So did you, as an importer, use reasonable care when making your imports into the United States? Did you put the right classification, valuation, if you're using USMCA or any of the countries of origins? If you're claiming anti-dumping doesn't exist for your particular product, what's your background? What's your rationale as to why you're stating this? Quite often, companies get it wrong and customs is issuing what we call CBP 28s, requests for information. That's not friendly. We've got a lot of blogs on this if you want to read up. When you get a request for information, customs is on to you. They're not happy with you for something. And when you get this, this is your warning sign to wake up and get counsel involved. We see a lot of nonchalant or no responses to 28s, and that's the beginning of a penalty. That's the beginning of an audit. That's the beginning of something incredibly adversarial thereafter. And I wanted to point you to the seizures and the intellectual property rights penalties. Those are huge because what we're seeing next also are EPA investigations, seizures, and so on. When it comes to EPA, that's the Enforce and Protect Act. There is nothing friendly about the Enforce and Protect Act. It's a secret allegation where someone is telling on you to customs saying you're avoiding anti-dumping duties likely by transshipping. So what customs has created are new dashboards. One is specifically for EPA, for the Enforce and Protect Act. So if I get to say, I know that David is transshipping, he's really making goods in China, but he's shipping them to Malaysia and he's putting a country of origin, Malaysia, on those goods and he's avoiding anti-dumping. 
I can file an EPA allegation with my claim against him. And the number one allegation for these EPAs is transshipment. And I want you to look at all the countries involved. Canada's on the list, right? Canada was a friendly. What do you mean they're on the list? They're on the list. Everyone's on the list. I mean, everyone's going to get on the list at some point in time. So you've got India, Cambodia, a lot. Many countries that you wouldn't necessarily think that there is a potential issue with could be involved in these transshipment schemes. Or even worse, you may not be involved, but then it's up to you to prove that you're not. So an EPA case is a beginning of a death sentence for many companies because it can suck the blood and life out of you to prove that you're really not a party to this madness as well. On the second hand, the e-allegations we file a lot of for companies, these are anonymous allegations for the most part, but the reason you use a counsel, an attorney, to file it on your behalf is you get to communicate with customs and discuss the status, versus otherwise, if you file it anonymously, you never get to really weigh in. You never get to know anything about what's going on with the case. Now, e-allegations, when you're submitting them, the number one submission that's here is intellectual property rights. So I want to make a note to any of you, if you have a brand that can be protected by customs and you don't have that brand recorded with customs, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to have customs protect your brand. If you have any questions about brand protection, I urge you to contact us. We've got a strong IP team that just does brand protection from USPTO and customs recordations. It's a huge piece and customs takes it incredibly seriously. But looking on there, I want you to also see that forced labor is a quick number four. And then you'll see the other priority trade initiatives, valuation, country of origin. Those all have to do with revenue collection at the end of the day. So anti-dumping, transshipment, classification, valuation, all of the core of U.S. Customs Enforcement is still here, which turns us to forced labor. There is so much going on in the forced labor space, Dana. Fill us in. Yeah, you bet. This is the, I have several things I'd love to cover if we have time, but this is the biggest thing. This is the thing in customs that's shaken up the landscape for the last two years, three years, um, and it's not going away. So if you haven't taken steps to address forced labor and you import from really anywhere, um, you, you should be, and, the, and this is why. So in 2022, uh, Congress passed the um, Weaker Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act, which basically establishes a rebuttable presumption that goods from the Xinjiang region of China or produced by goods on the entity list um, can't be imported into the United States. And it builds on other existing forced labor uh, law that's already there. If we have time, we'll talk about that. But basically it says you can't bring them in if they're from this region or if you're on the list. It sounds really contained. It sounds like, well, this is just one region of China. I can just check. Here's what happens in reality is that it, there, there's no de minimis um, for, for this. So even if you have a really complicated good, um, if you have even one small part that was created in Xinjiang or by someone by the entity list, um, a company on the entity list, it's prohibited from entry into the U.S. Um, and tying on to some what some other folks have said, it's not just if your country of origin is China. As you can see on this chart, the country with the highest number of detentions under the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which is China, is actually Malaysia now. And this has changed from a year ago. A year ago, the country with the highest number of detentions, the country of origin was China, but it's changed over the last 12 months so that actually there are more shipments ostensibly from Malaysia that are being detained, uh, followed by Vietnam, followed by China, that are being stopped because it's suspected that there's a part in this, in this shipment that came from the Xinjiang region or was made by somebody on the entity list. Uh, and so um, it's, Again, there's no there's no de minimis. If there's any part of it at all that came from from there, uh, then you can be in trouble. And it can be really hard to tell. There are a ton of software companies that have sprung up over the last couple of years to try and help U.S. importers and others figure out where their stuff is from. Um, it's not enough to just know your supplier, the, the company that you buy from. You have to know your entire supply chain all the way back to the raw material. So if you're importing shirts, for example, men's shirts, you need to know where, if it's made um, from polyester, where the fibers came from, if it's made from, from cotton, where the, the cotton was baled, you need to know all the way back to the supply chain. And that can involve dozens of entities. And um, there are companies within supply chains that know that they are 
on the list or um, are from this region that are using shell companies, they're changing around, it can be really hard to keep up. Um, and so if you haven't already, sort of at a minimum, what your company needs to be thinking about doing if you import from, from China, from Malaysia, from Vietnam, um, and really from a, a lot of other countries, you need to be thinking about putting terms in your sales contracts. You need to be thinking about your code of conduct, updating that, and you need to be most importantly doing due diligence. And this can be, can be a really big ask, especially if you're a smaller company, especially if you're a company that imports from a lot of different suppliers. It can be really complex and time consuming to investigate the supply chains, which are ever changing um, for, for all of your for all of your suppliers, it can, and, and I'm not saying this is easy. I'm just saying that the there's a couple of different things that happen if if you do get detained under the um, the UFLPA or under a WRO. Is that one? It can take a while for your goods to be released, even if it turns out your supply chain is clean. It can take if, if you haven't already done the legwork to gather documents and figure out sort of everything, showing exactly where everything came from, all the way back to all of the raw materials. It can take months, as you can imagine, to, to gather all that paperwork. So you, you've really got to be proactive. Um, and then just, just looking at this slide, it used to be that, uh, you know, the first sort of um, commodities that came onto the list were tomatoes and cotton and, and polysilicon. But now it's, it's a really, it's almost everything that's, <laughs> that's imported. Electronics is the number one thing, um, followed by different, uh, by apparel, followed by um, industrial and manufacturing materials followed by, followed by, followed by. CBP has a pretty broad reach. They are definitely using software to target higher risk places, higher risk um, commodities, but their, their, their net is getting broader and broader. And this is not something that's going to change or shrink. It's only going to get broader. So if, even if you happen to be importing something from China, it is not on one of these lists. It, it very well could be and in the near future. Um, another thing that's changed from, uh, from last year uh, is that the total number, the, these numbers on here, the 7,000 detentions, this is total from June 2022 when uh, the UFLPA went into effect. And it's right about 50-50. You'll see there's 2,972 denied and 2,974 released. It was actually um, a, a little more favorable to importers a year ago. There were more uh, released than were detained, but those numbers have shifted. Um, I don't know if anyone on this call has actually had anything with, withheld from CBP, but if you import from China, there's a really good chance that something will be, and you'll be given a notice, and you'll have 30 days to uh, figure out how to how to produce all the paperwork you need to to show all of the raw materials, all, all the supply chains, all the way back to the raw materials. And even if you um, decide not to go ahead and, and import, in, in addition to the disruption in supply chain, you're, you're now on CBP's list, and they will probably ask about your next importation too. We see this, we see this all the time. So um, the, the bottom line is if you're importing from, from China or, or from Malaysia or from Vietnam or from elsewhere in Asia, you really should be thinking about um, doing your due diligence on, on your supply chains um, and figuring out exactly where things are being made. Um, I want to make one quick point, Dana, because you brought up a great yeah. point about software. Customs has made it publicly known that they have purchased software. So I do want everyone here to know you are in the dark if you don't have access to the same level of information that Customs has. Because the reason Customs is able to target effectively from these other countries is Customs has supply chain data. They're spending gazillions of dollars working with numerous entities to have visibility into supply chains to see this entity in China shipped to this entity in Malaysia, for example, who then ships to the United States. So I want to stop this. And when customs stops your particular goods on a detention, customs isn't nice enough to tell you what the problem is and what they specifically want. They say it's up to you to show with clear and convincing evidence that the entire product is perfectly fine and whatever raw material they have an issue with, they're not nice enough to tell you. So this is a tougher bargain for smaller, medium-sized entities that don't necessarily have great relationships with the direct manufacturer who purchases and sources all of the raw materials. When you're a middleman buying online, this, your, your Amazon Alibaba days and complying with forced labor are gonna be incredibly difficult because you don't necessarily know who's making the goods and you don't have direct communication. But I want you to know, Customs has extra visibility here that we don't. 
Yes, and, and a lot of companies that can afford to are buying their own software to try and track all of their supply chains. It's not cheap, it does change all the time. Um, a lot of people don't have dedicated customs people who can, can keep track of, of the changes that happen all the time. Um, and it's, it, it's challenging, um, but if you do get detained, we, we, can, we can help you, let us, let us know. Um, I, we don't have a ton of time left. I'd love to just talk quickly about other WROs. It, it, the, China's not the only company that has, or only country that has forced labor issues. There are dozens of withhold release orders which prevent goods from coming into the U.S. because forced labor is associated with the product. The most recent was sugar from the Dominican Republic. Um, there's also things in the works. We definitely know there's things in the pipeline. So any day CBP could come out with more withhold release orders. So forced labor is probably the biggest thing in um, in customs enforcement. Uh, and, but I also want to talk briefly about um, Section 301. This has been seven and a half to 25 percent tariffs on goods from China. And goods from China means not just shipped from China, but if a lot of the parts were from China, but it was the product was finished in, say, Malaysia, pick on Malaysia again, it could still be country of origin China. So CBP has some very specific rules called substantial transformation. And if you don't do sufficient manufacturing and addition of a, more materials from other countries than, than China, even if it's finished and shipped from a third country, you can still be subject to Section 301 and also any applicable anti-dumping, et cetera. Um, so uh, there are a few exclusions to these, which means you don't have to pay the additional 25% tariffs. There are officially um, a little under 400, um, 350 plus some COVID related things that are on things like hand sanitizer, rubber gloves, face masks, those types of things. And they've been extended to May 31st, 2024. CBP was accepting comments on whether those should be extended. Most of the comments um, said they should be. They're from uh, US companies that import those goods. Um, but we'll, we'll see that those could drop off at any time. Um, and um, you know, on, on that exclusion front, just one more quick point. What we're seeing customs do on the ground is enforce these exclusions, basically saying if you want to utilize the exclusion, then you better have A, done it at the time of entry, or B, they send you a request for information saying prove you have the right to utilize the exclusion. So if you're using an exclusion without being 100% sure your product falls within the scope of that exclusion, that is a huge issue we're now seeing companies get penalized for, as well as double invoicing, which is a famous name of the game. We're seeing companies go to jail and it, companies get criminally charged and as well as individuals criminally charged and individuals that have gone to jail as a result of this. So if anyone from anywhere ever says, here's one invoice for you to pay me and here's a separate invoice for any reason, I, I want you to associate that with criminal activity because customs absolutely does. We've been filing a lot of prior disclosures with customs to attempt to keep the company and the individuals involved out of the criminal enforcement landscape. And on that note, Dana, there's a webinar coming up that I did want you to tell everyone about as well. And we have a special code for all of our Mondac listeners today. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, basically um, one of the, the things that can happen if you're not following all of the rules, and there are many for customs, is customs penalties, but there's also the False Claims Act. And what the False Claims Act means is that if you get in trouble and a lot of times, it can be someone from even within your own company that can be a whistleblower, or it can be a competitor that's analyzing trade data and saying, look, I don't think this, these, this company is following the rules. Under the False Claims Act, you can be charged triple, trouble damages. So you would have to pay not only what you didn't pay customs in the first place, but three times that, that amount um, under the False Claims Act, which is a civil, uh, it's a civil statute that's been around since the Civil War, actually. Um, and, and so we've seen an uptick in these cases uh, it used to be mostly in the healthcare industry, but we're seeing a lot of them more and more every year in the custom space. Um, so yes, our, our webinar is on January 9th. Please sign up for that if you want to learn more about On May 9th. Concept. On May 9th. Yeah, on May, May 9th. 9th. Um, <laughs> and um, we also had some past webinars as well. So if you go to diaztradelot.com slash shop, that's where you'll see, for example, an in-depth webinar with Rick and I talking about MOCRA. So if you are an entity that's tied, that's has to comply with the Cosmetics Act and you're, you're trying to figure out what to do, for example, we've got over 20 webinars in our database and all of you that are with us today from Mondek get 25% off of all past webinars. We also have great webinars with David talking about 232 and, 
and such and 301 for, for all of you. We also have a blog to keep you in the loop. Every day we read federal register notices and that's the customs expectation of you as importers. To read federal register notices every day from all of these government agencies, to read the bulletin, to know what's going on with all of the cases, to know what's going on with 600 plus anti-dumping duty orders, to know what's going on with FDA and such, it's, it's a lot. So if you need to keep up in this particular landscape, if you're an importer, I, I highly urge you to connect with us on our blog and or our newsletter that we issue monthly to keep you in the loop with what's going on in the trade world because it is a lot. We've got the cutest dog in the world. This is our head of security. So I'll, I'll debate the cutest dog in the world context and I'd love to see your dog pictures. He's our head of security. If you ever come visit us at Diaz Trade Law, we're really thankful to have an hour with you today. I know we are right there time-wise. We have lots of ways to keep in touch with us. We look forward to hearing all of your questions as well. If you have others that you'd like to talk to us about, or if you want our top 10 tips cheat sheet for our anti-dumping circle, then please email us anytime at info at diaztradelaw.com. We'd love to hear your anti-dumping FDA False Claims Act slash, we can talk all the talk when it comes to anything import or export or other government agency related. We really appreciate the Mondac crew for giving us the opportunity to communicate with you today and hope to be in touch with all of you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very thank much, you. Jen. You've done a fantastic job letting everybody know how to get in contact with you. I would just like to say thank you very much to all of our panelists today. Um, for your insights, an incredibly informative session. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Thank you again to our panel. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day.